I'm Kirk French. I'm an archaeologist, and I teach in the Department of Anthropology here at Penn State. My name is Chris Duffy. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering. I'm a hydrologist, and we work on watershed modeling in different places around the country and around the world. This is a map of Palenque created by Ed Barnhart. As an undergrad, I went down there to volunteer. While making this map over a three-year period, we kept finding very peculiar water features, and I was very excited about it. I started trying to locate every water feature I could, and ended up stumbling on top of the one out in the Piedras Bolas, which turned out to be a water pressure system and the earliest one known in the uh, New World. So what you're seeing is about a square meter. You can see where the red arrow is. It actually decreases in size abruptly. An easy way to think about this is you have a water hose and it has pressure on it already, but you put your thumb over it, decrease the size of the outlet, creating more pressure. And that's really what this is doing. And it also allowed them to control the release through that outlet more easily. So the smaller opening could be filled with chalk stone or something. This conduit was something like 60 meters long. And, so it, and it started six meters in elevation higher than that outlet. And so the amount of pressure or head that they could recover was potentially up to around six meters. And so that's the usable part of the pressure. And so in a closed conduit, when you turn on your tap, basically you're using the water pressure of the tower to drive the water pressure through the homes. Well, the Maya had the same thing. As you can see, they did it with stone, which is sort of fabulous. People started settling around the Palenque area as early as about 100 BC. Palenque continued till about 800 AD. It's very small, only two square kilometers, and it's built on very steep terrain. There's a very small flat area that the majority of it's built on, and then it's built up into the mountains and on an escarpment as it drops off to the plains. Here we're down in the plains where today is agricultural land used for cattle, also for growing corn. A lot of people consider it one of the most beautiful of Maya sites. The stucco art that they have there is beyond anything else at other sites. It's captivating. It's an amazing place, really. And then when you get to hike around in the jungle, which is often off limits, so we're going with the archaeologists, if you can get a pass that gets you in other places even the tourists wouldn't get to go. Palenque gets over 3,300 millimeters of rainfall a year, which is the equivalent of about 110 inches between September and December. Now, this is just a great shot to show a side of the aqueduct that we don't get to see very often because we're usually there in the dry season. What's interesting as well is that this aqueduct still functions. So one of the things we wanted to do was to measure the actual flow rate so we'd have some idea of how much water did the Maya have to deal with. And so we brought an acoustic device that measures the flow velocity. So this is me uh, in the Otaloom, and I'm installing a pressure transducer, which really measures the pressure of the water, the depth. So I went home that night and thought about how to take a photograph of it, and I thought I needed some glass. So I used a casserole dish. You put it on the water, and then everything clears up, and then you take a photo of it. We found this water pressure system. We want to know how it was used. There are these features in the palace that have long been suggested as toilets of some kind. They're all on the same drain. They are shaped like toilets in the sense that they are the right height, fairly low. You sit on them. There's a drain that connects all four of them. There's also a sweat bath. So we would love to use some ground penetrating radar, which kind of x-rays underground. We also want to get a deeper understanding of how people understand their water and how do you manipulate water and how do you engineer features that allow you to use it more efficiently, especially when you have very long dry seasons. These Maya were wonderful engineers in that sense. I just assumed that at other universities, this kind of cross-disciplinary research happened all the time. And it was really Chris that told me, and, and several other full professors that have told me that, oh, no, at, at other universities, it's not like that. So one of the more satisfying parts to this research is the chance for a water resources engineer to work with an archaeologist. And this is really a strength that Penn State has. There's no penalties for crossing borders of research. And also, I think that's where the, the new science is going to be, at the fringes of multiple disciplines.